Well, hey, 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 welcome to the house. My name's Nick. Um, if you're in the back grabbing coffees, why don't you come on up here and join us? Uh, yeah, if you all that are here ready can take a stand. Uh, we're going to worship a bit tonight. Yeah. 
Hey, good evening. Welcome here to the house. Uh, so good to be together. So good to have you join us this evening. Looking forward to a great uh, night together as we continue to sing and worship and uh, open scripture and see what God has in store for us tonight. I uh, love that this is part of your rhythm uh, of coming here on a Sunday because uh, certainly this is not the only time we, we come together and not the only time we uh, come as as. God's people as believers and, and gather together and encounter His presence, but there is something so special and powerful about doing this, having this rhythm of kind of gathering together on a weekly basis, and then we go from here in, in about an hour, hour and a half. We're going to go from here. You're going to go back into your workplaces, back into your school, your dorms, your, your neighborhoods, and you get to be God's people there, but there's something so special as we come together and, and worship and be in community and build one another up and and encourage one another uh, it's kind of like it recharges us and refreshes us and then we get sent out again and so uh, excited that you're here to do that with us we're gonna we're gonna do that together and and there's no perfect people in here we all come and we bring our baggage from this week from this month from this year uh, we come as broken people who, who are desperate for for God to show up and meet us and make us whole again uh, but we do this as a community and so we're going to sing we're going to worship uh, Bethany and Nick and the team are going to lead us it's going to be an awesome night together as we worship uh, so why don't we pray as we just uh, continue to worship together Lord we thank you God you are among us already you are at work already and Lord we want to we want to come together as a community as your people to encounter you to uh, be shaped by you, to be filled by you. We pray that you would come and meet us. You would remind us of your goodness. You would remind us of your presence, of who you are, your character, and that and that, that would shape us as we uh, worship, as we gather this evening, and ultimately as we go this evening, that your presence here would shape us. So we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me There was another in the waters Holding back the sea and Should I ever need reminding Of how I've been set free There was a cross that bears the burn Where another died for me There is another in the fire
but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. Let's repeat those lines once more time. There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is and will be through it all. Come on, me in the space between all the things I've seen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. I know. I know. show up and you you are there and I, as, as we sing this next song I just encourage you to think about all the times in your life be it a current situation or something in the past that God has shown up
this service that anything that we need to hear tonight that you would you would speak that to us and reveal it to us you may be seated amen amen hey good evening why don't we thank the team for leading us before we go further I want to say welcome to you welcome to you who are tuning in on our live stream whether you're Tuning in live, tuning in later this week, good to have you with us, uh, and it's a full house in here, so it's good to be together. Glad you could join us tonight. Uh, my name's Oliver, I'm the Connections Pastor here, and uh, excited to see what uh, God is doing in our community as we keep coming together and gathering, and, and then get sent out and uh, into the world and hear some stories of what God is up to in your lives. Uh, Want to let you know... If you are brand new to our community, we would love to uh, get, get to know you a little bit, get to hear your story a little bit, and also treat you to a coffee at the coffee bar. Uh, we've got some cool little coffee cards at the info booth, which is the place where you can find out all the different information about our community, about what's happening here throughout the week, this month, um, but also there's coffee cards there. So if you're new here, we'd love to say welcome by treating you. Uh, Want to let you know about a couple things happening in our community, uh, but first, how many people have either started decorating or started listening to Christmas things? Okay, we've got some pro-Christmas people in the house. Uh, I, it's, it's early, it's early, but my amazing, wonderful wife has decorated the house. We've got the tree up, we've got like Christmas scents wafting through the rooms. I'm washing my hands and there's like pine needle soap, like, like all over the place, there's jingle bells, there's a lot of things happening. It, it's Christmas for the next three months. So Christmas is coming quick. We've got lots of great things in store, but I want to let you know in a couple weeks from now, we are doing a baptism service, December 1st. Uh, two weeks away is December. Uh, and and want to just throw this out there. If you've maybe been on the fence, if you've got some questions, maybe you've uh, thought, I should get baptized, or I know someone who got baptized, uh, but I've got some questions about it. We would love to chat with you. Uh, there's a sign-up at the info booth. There's a sign-up online. If you are kind of wondering what that looks like, what that means, uh, how perfect you have to be, we would love to chat with you. There's no perfect time to get baptized. There's no perfect people who get baptized. Uh, it's not a symbol that you have arrived at your destination. It's a, it's a symbol of you committing to follow Jesus, whatever that looks like in this current season. And so um, if you are a Christian and you're here and you haven't been baptized, I want to just subtly, gently push you under the water in a couple weeks. Uh, <laughs> seriously, I want to challenge you uh, to consider getting baptized, not because it's uh, cool, not because it's uh, cool for us to have people get baptized, but because it's a really amazing, awesome next step in your faith. It's great for our community to be a part of it, but really in, in Scripture, believing and baptized, getting baptized often went together. They were kind of uh, two things you, you did kind of back to back, and so uh, we've, we've drawn it out, the process, and so want to challenge you to maybe consider it and chat with us if that's something you're thinking about. A uh, couple things closer. This week, Tuesday, we have an education affinity group happening, which is a group for people who are working in, interested in, maybe you're studying to become part of the education field. We host a, an evening every couple months here. Uh, it's happening this Tuesday at 7.30. And it's the, the topic this week is uh, talking about anxiety in the classroom. We have one of our amazing gifted counselors coming to chat with us about what that looks like and how to navigate some of those things. And so uh, if that interests you at all, you can just show up 7.30 on Tuesday. It's going to be an awesome evening. I also want to let you know, I know some of you are out at the university. Maybe some of you are in Vernon. Next Sunday, 
after our second morning service, so we have a morning service at 11. After that service, we have a gathering in Vernon. So if some of you are in Lake Country, Vernon, this might be a place for you to connect. Uh, we're going to gather next Sunday after the 11 o'clock service, around 1 o'clock out in Vernon, and we'd love for you to join us for that. Uh, again, more info at the info booth, but just want to throw that out there. And lastly, uh, the following week, not this Wednesday, but next Wednesday, we're going to do an outreach night. And so we're going to go downtown. We're going to uh, serve some people down there, connect with them, pray with them, uh, and just really uh, do what we can, do our part to kind of serve and represent Jesus downtown. And so um, that's coming up, not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday. So there's some things to think about, some things to put in your calendar. I know you're all busy watching Netflix and doing other important things, but uh, there's some great things happening here. So excited to be a part of those. Uh, with that, I'm going to invite up Ed. Uh, Ed is uh, a real treat, a gift to our community. Uh, in fact, Ed uh, has spoken has spoken twice already today, and this is round three, and so excited for Ed to, to speak. Ed, I think, has two really great gifts to our community. One is, is that Ed obviously is a great speaker, isn't he? He's a great communicator. We, we love, we appreciate Ed's gift, his heart. The other one is that Ed has the spiritual gift of staying completely, perfectly tanned all year round. Um, <laughs> And I'm not sure how he does it, but we're thankful for it because we benefit, benefit from it. So I'm going to pray before we go any further. Lord, thank you for this evening. God, thank you for uh, this community that comes together Sunday nights uh, from so many different places, from school, from work, from uh, just hanging around and looking for something to do. God, we know there's so many people here who are uh, here for a number of reasons. But Lord, in this moment, in this time, we ask that you would speak to us, that you would meet us and shape us and inspire us, encourage us, challenge us to be your people, to be the kind of people uh, that look and smell and, and sound like Jesus. And so God, we pray that you would speak to us now through Ed. In Jesus' name, amen. Good evening, everybody. I don't think these lights are hot enough. I think we could, uh, I don't even know why we have a furnace in this building. We just turn the lights on and the room will heat up. I have such a simple talk for you this evening. It, it is just so simple. It is two verses and one point. All right. Two verses, one point. Let's get at it. In Ephesians chapter five, in the very first verse, the Bible says this, imitate God. Therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. It's so simple. He said, imitate God. Why? Why imitate God? Because you are children of God. You are much loved children of God. And this is how you imitate God. You live a life filled with love. A life filled with love that looked like Jesus. And you want to know why? Because selfless love is a delightful fragrance to God. I submit to you tonight that selfless love is the gold coin of heaven's currency, selfless, selfless love. You know, the apostle Paul, he sure was smart. He, 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 he called us imitators. He said, be imitators. And we are all imitators. As children, we imitate adults. Children imitate their, their favorite adults, their hero adults. They dress like them. They, 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 they try to talk like them. My grandson, who's six, was in Rutland, and what was that wrestling thing they did in Rutland? They do it every year. They bring in these wrestlers, and they do that, you, you know, jumping off the ropes wrestling and that kind of stuff. And there's a guy in there, and he, he, he's just jacked. He's kind of like the, everybody's favorite. Don't ask me why my son would take my grandkids to wrestling in Rutland, but he did. And, and ever since then, my little grandson, he comes into the house. As soon as he wants to wrestle, he rips his shirt off. He flexes, he growls, and then he pounces. And he comes in with the elbow. And he's got all these moves he learned from going wrestling in Rutland once. Because we're imitators. That's what we do. 
And I submit to you that what adults are to children, culture is to adults. So much of why you do what you do is because you're imitating culture. You don't even know why you like certain things, but you like some things and other things because you see it in culture. When I was a kid, only sailors and bikers had tattoos. Literally. They were the only people that ever had tattoos. There were so few tattoo parlors around. You, you had to look hard to find one. And I think about 15 years ago, somebody decided to get a, their entire sleeve tattooed. And since that day, an entire generation has imitated them because you can't swing a dead cat in a room without hitting somebody with a full sleeve. <laughs> Don't know why you'd want to swing dead a cat in the room, but you can't do that without hitting one. <laughs> okay, these jeans I'm wearing, Oliver told me they're called skinny jeans, okay? And they're really flexible. I really love them. And do you want to know why I'm wearing skinny jeans now? Because Oliver wears skinny jeans. <laughs> and he comes into staff meetings during the week looking all skinny. <laughs> but he explained to me that there's two kinds of skinny jeans. These are just kind of like baggy skinny jeans, but because they're not skinny down at my calf. But he's got these skinny jeans. If you look at them, they look like a nylon. <laughs> he looks like he's wearing a denim nylon, right? Denim pantyhose, right? <laughs> so the reason I'm wearing skinny jeans is because of Oliver. The reason Oliver's wearing skinny jeans is somebody that he thinks is very cool was wearing them. And he saw that person. He's imitating that person. And I'm imitating him. You know why? Because we are imitators. David Bowie, Paul McCartney in the 70s changed their haircuts. They decided to cut it short up front and let it go in the back. Why would anybody do that to themselves? But you want to know something? My entire generation, men around the world, decided to cut their hair short in the front. Because even if you have just a cul-de-sac of hair, you know, you could let it grow long and strong, and you'd be cool, especially if you wore a baseball cap, okay? Why do we do this stuff? Well, why do some of you guys shave the side of your head now and then kind of get it all looking like that? You know why you do? Culture. You're imitating culture. That's what you do. That's what we all do. Now, let me tell you this. The way we're wired as human beings... We mirror the affections of our heart. Whatever holds the affection of your heart is what your life will mirror. If the very thing that holds the affection of your heart is status, is power, is influence, is stuff, those are the things that are going to drive your behavior. <coughs> those are the things that are going to drive your being. Jesus said something interesting. He said, not that those are evil. None of those are evil, but if they're your primary focus, they'll dominate everything in your life. Jesus said, if your eye is evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if the light, the light that is in you is darkness, he said, how great then is the darkness? I've read that verse a hundred times. I spent some time with it this week, and this is what I think it means. If your eye is utterly selfish, if your eye is self-absorbed, then your whole body will be full of you and only you. If therefore the light that is in you is blind to everybody else, then how great is the darkness that's in you? If my first statement is true, if it is, that selfless giving of yourself is a fragrance to God, a pleasing fragrance to God, then I suggest that a self-absorbed, selfish person 
stinks to God. If you're in here and you're really self-absorbed, it's all about you, you're selfish, then God loves you. Don't get me wrong. He just doesn't like the way you smell. I like the way um, the, the message translation gives us that verse in Ephesians 5. It says this, watch what God does and then do it. And, sorry, and then you do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is he loves you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. And he didn't love you in order to get something from you, but to give everything of himself to us. Just look like that. Look like that. The, the Apostle Paul is saying here, if you're going to mirror anything, mirror God. If you're going to imitate anything, imitate Christ. For just as a mirror is designed to reflect back the light that is shined into it, so you are created to reflect back the love that abounds to you, the goodness that abounds to you, all of the grace that comes your way every single day. We were created to mirror extravagant, selfless compassion and love. That's what God made you for. And you're not going to get that by mirroring culture. The only place you're going to get that, if you begin to look into, into who Christ is, you begin to feed off of who he is in your life, that's where those qualities will come from in your life. I love this verse in Colossians 3, verse 12. It says, here it is again. Therefore, it's God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. You are dearly, I don't care what a bad day you've had. I don't care if your sin rate is off the charts this week. The Bible says you are a dearly loved child of God. He said, clothe yourself, clothe yourself in compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. I love that. You see, when God put compassion and kindness and goodness inside of every one of us, it's there. It exists. If he is in you, goodness, compassion, kindness, patience is in you. It's when you express that to each other that it becomes an incredible fragrance, not just to God, it becomes an incredible fragrance, period. Shay and his father were walking by a field. And the boys were playing baseball. And there were two teams going at it. And Shay said to his dad, Dad, you, do you think they would ever let me play with them? And this was a difficult question because, you see, Shay was physically and mentally handicapped. And his father said to him, son, I, 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 I don't know. You see, his dad knew that he'd be a liability athletically to any team that chose him. But he also knew how desperately he wanted to belong to something, belong to a team, how he wanted to experience that kind of thing. And so the father went to the fence and called over one of the outfielders. And he said, this is my son. Truth is, he's never actually played baseball before. But do you think that he could hang out with you guys just for, just for a little while? Do you think that that would be possible? Is there any way that you could make that happen? And this poor kid, he's out in center field, and he, he can't even talk to his other teammates. And, and he says to the man, he says, well, sir, we're in the eighth inning. We're down by six runs. He said, if he doesn't mind playing on a losing team, he can come and join us. Well, Shay and his father made their way over the bench, and this was very, very expensive. Nobody saw this coming when he got up that morning. And he's sitting on the bench, and he's watching, and he's smiling from ear to ear. Then somebody brings over a team jersey, and they give it to him. They say, put this on. He's wearing a team jersey. 
Shea's team got four runs in in the eighth inning. And when all the guys, when the team came in for the ninth inning, the young boy introduced Shea to everybody. And Shea, he didn't, he was socially awkward and he was clearly not knowing what to say. So he just smiled. They put a glove in his hand and they said, you play right field today. Last inning, you're out in the field. He didn't know how to put it on. They helped him put the glove on. And then one of the players walked him out to the field where he's supposed to stand. It took a long time because of his handicap. And he got in the field and he never moved from that point. But he took it all in and he smiled from ear to ear the entire time he was in the field. And when their team, it was time to come up to bat. They put three runners on the bases. Two out, they had one hitter left. And they knew that if they could get one of their big hitters in, that they could win this game. There's no coach here. These are just kids putting together a pickup game. And to everybody's amazement, the little boy who picked Shay on his team said, Shay, you're going to bat next. And the other pitchers looking at him like, what are you doing? And when Shay got up to bat, he didn't know how to hold a bat. And so the bat catcher from the other team showed him how to hold a bat. The bat catcher from the other team's coaching him when to swing. The pitcher saw that the other team had just given up a win for this moment in this child's life. And so he brought it in, brought it right in. And he throws a really soft pitch. And Shea misses it by a mile. And he throws another one, not even close. And he comes really close. And he virtually throws the ball at the bat. And Shea gets a piece of it. And he hits this grounder, which goes right to the pitcher. The pitcher picks up the ball, and he's about to throw it to first base. And he hucks it way over first base's head. And then Shea's team starts screaming, run, run to first, go to first. He wasn't completely sure where first was. So the pitcher's pointing to first. And it was clumsy and it was awkward. And everybody's cheering. By the time he got to first, he was gassed because he had never actually run that far in his entire life. Seriously. And then, and then his team players and his teammates are saying, go to second, go to second. And he's running to second. By that time, the infielders got the ball or the, the right field's got the ball. And he could have thrown it to second, but just like the pitcher, he threw it way over second base. He gets to second base and he's just gassed. He can't do anymore. But by now, the stands are on their feet. Both teams, team on the field, team in his bench, cheering. The uh, shortstop, a big kid. From the other team, runs over to him on second base. He says, Shay, we got to get you to third base. And he virtually carries him to third base. Three players run in, and Shay finally makes it to home. And the place is going crazy. It's the greatest day of the boy's life. And he spoke of this day every day of the rest of his life which only happened to be a couple months because he died that winter. As I was reading that story this week, I thought to myself, you know those boys? It would have been so easy to miss this amazing moment. They could have just said, no, teams are full. Thanks, no, go. It would have been so easy to miss that moment because this was an inconvenience. But they didn't miss the moment. And they're part of a really, really great moment. But how many really, really great moments do you miss because you're so stinking selfish? Because you can't bother to be inconvenienced. How many really, really great moments do you miss out on because you're not even present in the moment? And if you're like me, I'm always in a hurry to get to the next moment because I think the next moment is definitely better than this moment and the next person's better than this person and we're always in a hurry. And I think to be an imitator of God, we got to learn to slow it down and to be present 
in this moment with this person in front of you. And if you walk into every person that comes into your life, not looking to get something, but looking to give something, then you are going to be part of an awful lot of really, really amazing stories. I, I heard about a deacon in a church that didn't deek very well because he was selfish. And the pastors are trying to get this guy engaged, do something. And he said to the, to the deacon, listen, the youth group, the worship team from the youth group, they go to a nursing home once a month and they lead in worship. He said, I'd like you to drive them if you wouldn't mind. And the deacon says, well, that's stupid. They can lead themselves in worship. With all the bad attitude that he brought, he got those stupid young people in the bus and he drove them to the nursing home. He watched them set up and he stood at the back with his arms crossed as they started to lead worship. And somebody pulled on his sleeve from beside him and he looked and there was an old man in a wheelchair pulling on his arm. And when the deacon put his arm down, the old man put his fingers interlocked with the, the deacon's fingers. And they stood there, or the deacon stood there for one hour holding the old man's hand. And the next month, the same thing happened. And the next month, and for several months after that. And then the deacon went back and the old man wasn't there. And so he, he asked the nurse, he said, where, where is he? She said, he's dying. She, he's dying. He's, he's, he's in his room if you'd like to see him. And so the deacon went to the room and there was the old man and he's got hoses in and out of him. Feeling a sense of connection to the old man, he sat down beside his bed. And when he sat down beside his bed, he put his hand on the old man's hand. The old man turned his hand and he grasped the hold of the deacon's hand. And the deacon prayed for him. And then the old man squeezed his hand and the deacon knew that his prayer had been heard. He's pretty emotional about this whole thing and he goes to leave and he meets a woman who's coming into the room. And the woman says to the deacon, he's been waiting for you. He said he didn't want to die until he held the hand of Jesus just one more time. And the deacon said, what are you talking about? And the woman said that my dad told me that once a month Jesus would come. And he would hold his hand for an entire hour. And he said to me, I don't want to die until I get the chance to hold Jesus' hand one more time. See, God will use you if you will stop making your life about you. God will use you if you can slow your life down enough to look into the face of the people in your life and ask yourself, what can I give to this person? How can I love this person? What do they need? You know what God will do? He'll start sharing his like with you. All of a sudden, you're going to start liking people for reasons you don't understand. This happens. I got this. I don't know how often, it happens all the time with me. I sit down and I start chatting with someone and I'm looking at their face and, and I'm listening to them and usually it's within seconds, boom, my light goes off. And well, I like you. I've already decided I like you. I don't care if you're gay or you're straight, if you're transgendering, it doesn't matter. My like is not a, is not a respecter of persons. It just goes off and then I go, okay. This is going to be a great moment in my life. The gold coin of God's currency is the weightiest thing on this planet. And that is selfless love. 
the weightiest thing on this planet. And I've talked about weightiness before. If you were to take a sledgehammer and you were to drop it off the bridge into the lake, I don't care how big Lake Okanagan is and, but, and how small the sledgehammer is, but the, 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 the lake will always give way to the sledgehammer because the sledgehammer is weightier. And when you begin to walk into rooms with a heart to serve, to give, with a heart to make others first. You walk into the room loaded with love, God's love. You've just become weightier than the room and the room shifts. The room shifts and people shift just because you're there. There's a city in Philadelphia and they have a huge psychiatric hospital. And the hospital decided that, that for the, the, some of the, the, the patients that were, that were recovering, that were you know, ready to get on, we, you know, could re-engage with culture, with society. They wanted to build uh, five halfway houses in, 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 in a nearby neighborhood. And they put this proposal before city council. Well, needless to say, the neighborhood was not happy. They didn't want a bunch of crazies living in their neighborhood. And so the, the day that the, the city council was to make their decision, that, that day the, the city hall was packed. Over 500 people in city hall yelling oppositions. There was such a commotion. It was so dis- chaotic and disorderly. Finally, finally, the council members called the, the, the meeting to order, and there isn't even a lot of discussion, just more yelling. When quickly one of the council members, he, he, he makes a motion that this proposal would be denied. And very quickly a seconder comes along and they unanimously vote to turn down the hospital's plan for halfway houses. It's a true story. No sooner had they voted did the back doors open up. And Mother Teresa walked in. And she walked down the, to the front of that city hall and she got on her knees in front of the the city council members and she said in the name of Jesus please make room for these God's children for if you reject them then you will be rejecting Jesus but if you affirm if you will embrace them you'll be embracing Jesus She lifted up her hands and five times she said in the name of God, please, 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 please make room for these God's children. And when she finished, there was not a noise, not a word, barely a breath in the room. A crowd that was rioting 10 minutes before is now speechless because the little nun shifted the room. When you have that kind of authority, you can shift the room. And then finally, a council member cleared his throat and said, I'd like to make a motion that we reverse our decision. They reversed the decision And they made room for these, God's children. And they made room for five halfway houses. Where where does that little woman get that kind of authority? It's the 10,000 times that she chose to put somebody else's needs before hers. It's the 10,000 times that she chose to bring heaven to earth by loving selflessly by giving of herself again and again and again. And when you live like that, your life takes on a weightiness and authority that you can't get mirroring anything else living any other way. The newspaper, uh, news, uh, cameras, news cameras had been following her the entire time she was in the city. She was in the city actually for another event She simply heard about this and decided not to miss this moment. She could have missed this moment just so easily. But that woman seems to be be so present where she needed to be present. I'm going to invite the band to come on up.
When you take his presence and his love into the world, you are stewarding God's most precious commodity. And yet we treat it like it's nothing. You're stewarding heaven's gold. That's what you're doing. When you take his, when you're intentional about taking his presence and his love into the world. And if you'll choose to be ambassador of his, of his, of his love, then I promise you, you will be one who shifts environments. And I pray that God will open our eyes to see the beauty of God's image in the people in your world, whether they believe like you or not, whether they actually look like you or not or smell like you, whether you understand them or not, but can you see his beauty in them? And then you release heaven when you affirm them in what you see. And these three remain, Paul said, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Why don't you stand? Let's pray. So Jesus, you loved us first. Help us to be a people that open our hearts to your love and your goodness and your compassion and your kindness and your mercy. Give us grace, Father, to be a people who are looking for moments to serve, looking for ways to love. And then, Jesus, I pray that you would release heaven's grace and goodness and beauty through us. In Jesus' name. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever bring we live for you yes we live for you jesus jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you, Jesus, we live for you. In holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you.
Hey, thanks for being a part of our community this evening. Thanks for worshiping with us. Uh, now we get to, we, we've gathered, now we get to go to our, our spaces of work and school and uh, life and, and imitate Christ there. And, and what a joy it is to do that together. And so uh, a couple things on your way out as you go. One is that if you would like to give this evening, uh, first we wanna say thank you. Uh, we have our donation station under the Scrabble board. There's a text to give option, online giving. Wanna say thank you for, for giving faithfully and generously. Can't do it without that. And uh, second is that, uh, just a quick note about Student Lounge. Tomorrow we're back, Student Lounge is back, uh, but we're only going till seven, not nine tomorrow. So just a, a minor change. Uh, otherwise, hey, we have some people here at the front who would love to pray with you. Uh, maybe there's something going on in your life in your heart, in your head, that you would love prayer for. We would be so honored to pray with you uh, this evening. And so uh, as we go, there's going to be some people here at the front who, who will be here to pray with you. Uh, if we don't see you before, we'll be back next Sunday night. Hope you can join us. Thanks for being with us. Uh, go and be Jesus to the world around you this week.